Coming to you from the late night computer and electronic shenanigans department at Walsh Motors, here's UXW Bill. Yes indeed, hello there everyone, I am UXW Bill and I absolutely love the word shenanigans. This is a pretty boring video that's probably not going to be worth watching, but I will at least make a token effort of keeping it short, because while I was watching live streams earlier tonight, a friend of mine happened to suggest that he'd enjoy watching a late-night, uninterruptible power supply repair video, and however basic of a repair this is, well, I'm going to make a video about it and hope that he actually watches it. Where did I get this UPS from? Well, this was actually one of two units that I saw at a grocery store. They were sitting in the hallway near the restrooms. They'd been there for several weeks. Well, I tried to nail down a manager to get permission about either taking them or buying them or doing something, because they're always worth a little bit of entertainment to me. And it must be an arrangement like those Russian nesting dolls with managers at this particular grocery store, because it took me a while to reach a manager who had enough clout to say that I could have permission to take these. So I got a 1000 volt amp trip light unit, and I got this much smaller Smart Power branded model. Smart Power is not a name you very often see in these things, so I think it's probably the more interesting of the two. This is actually an OEM design from Powercom, who has apparently rebadged it for a variety of different manufacturers over time. I have a Belkin unit that's almost identical to this, except that it has more LEDs on the front, and it also has a serial port on the back, although nobody seems to know what protocol it actually speaks, and Belkin has basically forgotten everything in the world about ever having made it. That's something I found at the Salvation Army some years ago and probably paid way too much for. But I digress. I find it amusing that there's a picture of a sine wave, a representation of a sine wave molded into the plastic on the front, because this unit does not have a true sine wave inverter. It's a modified sine inverter. So what's wrong with it? Well, I think it's a case of probable bad design. Let me get a little bit of a light going on here, so you might actually be able to see what I'm talking about. This unit worked when I brought it home. I plugged it in. It came right up. It even went to battery, although I haven't load tested it to see what it'll do just yet. I'm presuming that the battery is good. It's certainly not the original battery. But I took this thing apart, and I think I kind of ended up breaking it, because when I went to plug it back into the AC outlet, I noticed that it wouldn't power up properly, and if I jiggled the socket, the IEC socket where the plug connects, it'd make a sizzling and arcing noise, and you'd hear the relays ticking on and off inside here as though it was trying to do something, but it wasn't actually managing to get it done. Now, of course, it goes without saying that tinkering with anything line-connected like this is incredibly dangerous and an uninterruptible power supply, only doubly so because if the battery's hooked up and it's any good, the inverter could start at any time without warning, and that gives you additional dangerous exposure to hazardous waveforms, high current levels, and, of course, a high voltage output that could really spark you up quite good. So take my warning seriously, folks. Don't ever attempt to do anything like this unless you are absolutely certain of what it is that you're doing and you know and understand all the hazards. Or you're willing to throw caution to the wind and you agree that you're not going to sue UXW Bill into oblivion somewhere. In my defense, as I said previously, I'm not the first person who has been inside this UPS. Someone definitely replaced this battery, and I can't help but think that it probably wasn't new when it was put in. I think this was probably taken from something else. Here's the date code on the battery, whether that's the 23rd of December 2010 or the 23rd of October in the year 2012, I'm not entirely sure. I tend to lean toward the first interpretation, that it was December, t that it was December 23rd of 2010 when this battery was manufactured. And it looks like it was glued to another, probably from a UPS having much larger capacity, maybe a unit that even failed. It's hard telling. Anyway, like I said, this unit failed, and I'm going to go ahead and shed some light on exactly what ended up happening here. I definitely broke it when I took it apart. You see these push-on connectors? I believe these are the F1 size. I can never keep that straight, whether they're F1s or F2s. But if you look down here, you'll see where they're intended to connect. They go right onto that IEC socket, and I must say that I am very surprised to see them in such close proximity to one another. Look at that, there's a thumbprint in the dust on top of there. I wonder whose that is, because I don't think it's mine. <laughs> Digression. Um, 
I'm surprised those are in such close proximity to one another because I would think if ever a significant transient occurred on the power line that those could probably arc across and maybe even sustain an arc. I'm not sure. I, I don't really know much about the safety implications of line-connected electronics design, but what I do know is that these need to be connected down there. So I have to get them reconnected and that's the biggest part of my mission. I really thought that I'd broken this at first because as you can see there's just a stub of a connection down there at the bottom and I really thought I'd managed to rip off the mating connector and damage this and that I was going to have to look at possibly hardwiring a cord to this but such definitely does not appear to be the case. I think this will be a relatively easy fix and again I bring up the point that I was not the first person in here and who knows how gentle the previous entity was because if you look at these you can see they're splayed out pretty good like maybe someone just unknowingly and savagely ripped the cover off of this thing so what we'll do is we'll just crimp these back down using a very precision cheap set of pliers because that's what I have handy here on the bench I'll crimp them down just as tight as I can they're pretty well insulated, but I don't want them getting loose because I think they could short out on one another if they were floating around in there loose. Now, we have to make sure that the polarity is correct. I mean, technically, because you're working with alternating current, it doesn't matter. But for safety's sake, it absolutely does. So we have to get this absolutely right. And here in the United States of America, at least, watch me get this wrong because it's tired and I'm late. Here's one of our outlets. Hey there! Over here, in a properly wired outlet, you should have the neutral, and then over here you have the live, and you have the safety ground, which you should never, ever, ever float. There are very good reasons for that. Don't use an adapter improperly, although everybody and their dog does. So what we need to do, we need to make sure that the connections to the line and the neutral are made correctly. And probably the easiest way to do that is by way of an ohmmeter. So we'll get out a jumper clip here. We'll clip it onto something that isn't the ground connection. I don't know if I'm going to make this... I'm not, I don't know if I'm going to make it through this entire video without the camcorder's battery running out. But we'll turn the multimeter on to its tone alert, continuity test, and we'll just see which one of these is which. Okay, it looks like the top one is represented by that. So that one is probably, what should that be connected to? That one is probably the, watch me get this wrong on video. This is kind of a hokey arrangement. They put these two little pigtails on here, which have this interesting little sticker on them that says, Bypass function only, no UPS function. Meaning that these aren't even surge protected, they're just convenience outlets. I'm not sure why they even bothered. I might just cut these things out and take them off of here because they're pretty pointless. <laughs> but I think that that one is probably the neutral side of the line, and that's represented by this blue wire, and again, like I say, someone was in here previous to me, and I don't think they were too attentive to the lead dress, which is a fancy way of saying that's how they chose to route the cables. I'm not going to try to do this one-handed, so let me get everything hooked back up, and we'll verify that the polarity is, in fact, correct. All right, I went ahead and got a cord set, and I've hooked up my meter accordingly to make the tests. I've got the uh, continuity beeper selected once again, Got the neutral connection hooked up with a jumper lead there, and got it plugged into the IEC connector. The remaining connector inside here on the IEC connection should be the neutral. If it is, we'll hear a beep. Alright, so I got it right. Now all that remains is to simply put the other terminal back on there. They're much tighter now than they were, so that's definitely an improvement. Not only in fastening performance, but also safety, because loose electrical connections, they get hot. And that's how an awful lot of house fires actually get started. Not from really faulty appliances per se, or even partial or direct shorts across the line, or overfusing a circuit, but loose connections, bus bars, plugs, outlets, things like that. If you ever find yourself with an outlet that doesn't seem to hold a plug tightly, replace it straight away, because the home you save may well be your own. So let's get this other one connected and we'll just have a quick test here. 
There's everything hooked up again. The red wire and the blue wire are the ones that are of interest to us. I think you can see right away why this doesn't sit well with me, especially when you consider the proximity of the connection to ground, which for some reason they soldered, probably so it could never be broken, even through careless handling. But I really think there's a lot of risk for not only a potential arc over during a uh, transient condition, but also if the insulation over these spade lugs is compromised, or the insulating jacket around the two wires happens to be compromised, I think that sets up the possibility for this thing to have a short across the line situation, which in the best scenario would take out a fuse instantaneously. Let's just go ahead and see if we do in fact have a short on the line here. Doesn't look like we do, in fact it measures completely open. Well, we'll put it on the resistance range just to be sure. Yeah, it measures completely open, probably because the microcontroller's got to turn those relays on before anything can actually happen. So we'll get the batteries put back in, well, the battery put back in it, and we'll just see what it actually does. Everything's put back together now. I have a live power cord right here waiting in the wings, which means it's time for everyone's favorite thing in the whole wide room, and that would be the smoke test. Just a little word about the smoke test. Okay, folks, it, it was funny for a little while, but it's a dumb shtick, and it lived on far longer than intended. So I'm hoping that outside of a few special occasions when maybe I'm feeling ornery or quite a bit less than serious, which is pretty much all of the time, <laughs> um, I'm hoping that we can just let that rest and not let it overshadow the more serious and informative and hopefully useful portion of this video. So with that said, one more time, just for everybody's enjoyment, I want you to remember this. Smoke test! Alright, I heard the relays come on. So I'd say it's probably working. I don't smell any ozone. The lights in the room didn't go out or anything like that. All very good signs. Let's just unplug it and see what happens. And the relay shut off, so I think that it's probably fixed. But if we really want to verify that for sure, We'll get our handy, not really at all recommended for use on the AC power line meter out here. And we'll plug one of these into the hot side. Boy, those are tight. Of course, they're not really meant to have meter leads jammed in them either. Alright, we don't have anything going on right now, but let me see if I can get this thing to turn on. There we go. And there it switched to its battery for its self-test. Presumably it'll come off a battery here in a little bit, but maybe not. Or maybe I just dreamed that and it didn't really go on battery at all. But it looks like it has been restored to satisfactory working condition. So with all of that said and done, we'll turn it over. I'll invite you, as I always do, to leave a constructive comment if you happen to have one. And then I'll show you the English on the top, which you can pause the video to read if you want. I really love this bit right here about press power switch until BB sound to disable no load shutdown function. Which you actually could see a bit of the circuitry responsible for implementing that on that board in the back that had the relays on it. If you saw that thing that kind of looked like a transformer, that actually is a transformer of sorts. It's for current sensing purposes. And I suppose that it has two functions with this unit. It allows them to determine whether or not it has been overloaded, and it also allows them to detect whether or not there is actually any load attached to this thing that needs backing up. So kind of a handy little battery saver feature. It's interesting what they chose to implement on this unit. I find it interesting that they provided a power LED, and they put the markers for the overload and the on-battery LEDs, but they didn't actually populate them. And because I'm sure someone will point it out as though I don't have eyes and I can't see anything, there are dashed lines underneath the overload and on battery indicators to suggest that they are actually represented by beep tones. Serviceable, yes, but far less than absolute, especially as compared to the LEDs that the Belkin variant of this unit actually happens to have. So that's the entire video. Thank you as always for watching, and certainly do feel free to leave a constructive comment if you happen to have one.